Old Powell Hall on this beautiful, glorious spring afternoon. I know that you will be happy that you made the sacrifice to come in from the sunshine for what will be an engaging and fruitful conversation. My name is Karen Wright Marsh. I'm the Executive Director of Theological Horizons, which is centered at the Bonhoeffer House, just nearby on University Circle. On this, the 25th anniversary of Theological Horizons, it is my extraordinary pleasure to welcome you to the 2015 CAPS Lecture in Christian Theology with renowned author Philip Yancey. The CAPS Lecture in Christian Theology is an annual event made possible through the great generosity of our friends, Dr. and Mrs. W. Jerry Capps from Atlanta. And the CAPS Lecture Series provides a forum of public lectures for prominent theologians and scholars of religion from the United States and abroad to address issues of faith, meaning, and public life. We bring you today's lecture in partnership with the Project on Lived Theology in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia, and my thanks go to the director of the project, Professor Charles Marsh. <laughs> I also welcome you on behalf of the Virginia Festival of the Book, which is, uh, of, of which this lecture is a part, and the Festival of uh, the Commission for the Humanities. I'm gonna ask you to take a moment to silence your cell phones, but while you do that, you can tweet about this event <laughs> at hashtag VABook2015. Books signed by Mr. Yancey are for sale in the lobby, and he signed a lot. So thanks to you for that. I hope you'll also stop by the information table uh, from Theological Horizons and find out a bit about the work that we do. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the 2015 CAPS lecturer, Philip Yancey. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a few things about him. His title today is Two Themes That Haunt Me, Suffering and Grace. And here at the University of Virginia, we revere the spirit of inquiry, don't we? Students are pushed to challenge commonly held assumptions. Our scholars and researchers penetrate the surface of things to search for deeper dimensions. Throughout this year of tragedy and violence at the university, even this very week, our questions have gone far beyond the academic as we have struggled to reckon with our shattered views of ourselves, our community, and our academical traditions. Philip Yancey is a lifetime journalist and an editor-at-large at Christianity Today magazine. He joins us on this hallowed lawn today as one who is always asking questions, questions that we polite UVA folks might not even dare to ask. So simply look at the title of some of his books. Where is God when it hurts? What good is God in search of a faith that matters? What's so amazing about grace? Prayer, does it make any difference? Reaching for the invisible God, what can we expect to find? Church, why bother my personal pilgrimage? Rumors of another world, what are we missing? These are raw and searching questions, the questions of a pilgrim who is still on the way. Philip Yancey gives us permission to doubt, to rage, and then he invites us all into a daring, thoughtful, honest faith, a faith that makes a difference in the world for our university, for our own lives, even where they are in pain. So it's no wonder that Mr. Yancey has more than 15 million books in print, is published in 35 languages worldwide, and has garnered 13 gold medallion awards. Philip and his wife have very kindly traveled from the beautiful foothills of Colorado to be here with us today. And so it is with great gratitude and delight that I give you Philip Yancey as this year's distinguished CAPS lecture. Welcome to Charlottesville, Philip.
Well, knowing that this would be NCAA tournament weekend, <laughs> I deliberately chose two themes that would work either way. <laughs> and I must confess I'll be spending more time on suffering <laughs> than on grace tonight. But I chose these two themes because the church often gets them wrong. It tries to control them, it tries to package them, and in the process, it does some inestimable harm. As a writer, and then as, also as a Christian in recovery, as I joke from a toxic church, I've spent my career tackling these two questions. For 40 years, I've been writing, and it seems like no matter what I start writing about, I end up writing about either suffering or grace. And for 40 years, I've been going over my faith, picking up stones, cleaning them off, trying to figure out what is worth keeping and what is worth setting aside. First one is suffering. The church often tries to explain suffering and package it and often gets it wrong. When I was just one year old, my father contracted polio. He was in an iron lung. And a series of well-meaning Christians gathered around him and prayed and finally decided that it would be God's will that he be healed. So against all the doctor's advice, they removed him from the iron lung, and a little over a week later, he died. So my life has been lived out under the shadow of an error in theology. What we believe matters. Later, I became a journalist, and as I interviewed people, especially those who had gone through tragedy, again and again they would tell me what I was going through was bad enough, but the church made it worse. People would come in with their various theories of why this terrible thing had happened. Some would say, well, you must have done something terribly wrong for God to punish you like this. And the next person would come in and say, no, no, it wasn't God, it's the devil. The next person would come in and say, no, it's not the devil, it's God, but he's not punishing you. God has chosen you to be an example of how to suffer to others. And I just wanted to get well, they told me. The church made it worse. Sometimes well-intentioned things that we say make it worse. To those who have lost a child, God just wanted a little flower in heaven doesn't do much. Well, at least you have another child at home, that doesn't do it either. And even some things that people quote from the Bible, God doesn't put on you more than you can bear. All things work together for good. Those well-intentioned phrases at the wrong time can do more harm than good. I remember a movie starring Kevin Costner called The War, in which a young boy's father dies and, and they try to explain to him, well, God needed your father in heaven. And there's a poignant scene of the little boy shaking his fist, saying, yeah, but I need him more than you do. And that's how we often feel when tragedy strikes. I hear from those raised in predominantly Catholic countries in places like the Philippines and, and Latin America who tell me that their faith can, can often be mildly masochistic with their obsession with suffering so that they end up doing things like flagellating themselves as part of an act of worship. I hear from Protestants who tell me about a severe Calvinism that tries to get them to accept as God's will every little thing that happens, no matter how awful it is. So what response do we have but rejection or protest? Rejection is pretty common, and I'm sure especially all of you students have come across it and probably read it since you've been here at the University of Virginia. Any, pers any thinking person eventually tries to put together some of the bad things that happen in this world with the theory of a loving and a powerful God. How can we reconcile these things? The most recent case I came across was a column by Sally Quinn. Sally Quinn is an atheist, she says, ironically, that qualified her to be the religion editor for the Washington Post. Um, <laughs> how did she get that job, you may wonder. Well, 
for starters, she was married to Ben Bradley, the executive editor. And in this recent column, she described a discussion with her son on whether there is a God or not. She was shocked to discover her son was not an atheist, and she reviewed the reason she was. Her own father had been in the armed forces in the liberation of Dachau, and he described what it was like to move thousands of corpses killed by the Nazis. And after describing those scenes, he said, I could never believe in a loving God. Later, he was in the armed forces in Korea. When she was a little girl, she was sick. She was put in a hospital for eight months, surrounded by wounded and maimed soldiers that were fighting in the Korean conflict. And each time she asked herself, how could God possibly allow this? And then she had children of her own, and one son faced heart surgery. And to her surprise, she found herself praying. What else could, she, could I do? she said. So we're all stuck in this dilemma of trying to reconcile bad things that happen on this earth with a belief in a loving God, and yet when it happens to us, wanting to turn to that belief, to fall back on. Some reject, many do. Some protest, even firm believers. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Buechner, says it this way, I am not the Almighty God, but if I were Maybe I would, in mercy, either heal the unutterable pain of the world, or in mercy, kick the world to pieces in its pain. I take comfort in the fact that the Bible itself includes such words of protest. When I'm around college students, especially philosophy majors, I tell them, I challenge you to find a single argument against God in the new atheists, people like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, or in the older atheists, Voltaire, Bertrand Russell, David Hume, I challenge you to find a single argument in their writings that is not already included in the Bible. Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Habakkuk. I have respect for a God who not only allows us to protest, but actually gives us the words that we could use. Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winning author, writes of his time in Auschwitz, Inside the kingdom of night, I witnessed a strange trial. Three rabbis, all erudite and pious men, decided one winter evening to indict God for allowing God's children to be massacred. I remember, I was there, and I felt like crying but nobody cried. Later, he published a play, The Trial of God, it's called, and in the introduction to that play, Robert McAfee Brown elaborates, the trial lasted several nights. Witnesses were heard. Evidence was gathered. Conclusions were drawn, all of which issued finally in a unanimous verdict. The Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, was found guilty of crimes against creation and humankind. And then, after what Wiesel describes as an infinity of silence, the Talmudic scholar looked at the sky and said, it's time for evening prayers. And the members of the tribunal recited Mavri, the evening service. The rabbis concluded, God is guilty and God owes us something. And that's something we all sense, at least an explanation for some of the things that happen on this planet. Yet no explanation satisfies. I, God knows I've tried. Karen read some of the book titles, Disappointment with God, Where is God When It Hurts? I've lived in that kingdom of night. Not to mention a book I tried called The Gift, I, the Gift of Pain. There's a hard sell. It was originally called uh, the, gift, the Gift Nobody Wants, but it became the book that nobody wants. <laughs> so the publisher reissued it under a new title. <laughs> and I found that you may, you may shed light on pain as a protective system that has value in a world full of danger, but you can't explain the unfairness the random distribution, the 
the times when it overwhelms and swallows up everything else going on. A nurse told me I don't believe in God, and I can summarize why in two words, pediatric oncology. Every religion has to address this question. We're not alone, those of us who identify as Christians. Islam deals with it with a, with a more submissive feeling. Everything is God's will. We must simply accept it, which has echoes in hyper-Calvinism in Christianity as well. Buddhism is very realistic. It starts out by saying life is suffering. And for Buddhists, the conundrum is a little bit easier because they do not believe in a loving, personal God who governs the universe. Life is what it is. Embrace suffering, the Buddha say. Hinduism offers by far the most rational explanation in karma. Everything has a cause. And we are, those of us who suffer are simply living out things that occurred in a prior existence. It may take as many as eight million reincarnations, Hindu scholars say, to work all of that out. And I've spent time in India and I've run up against people in upper castes who, who actually resist charity because they feel that caring for outcasts keeps them from progressing. And if you help them, you hurt them by the law of karma. Christians sometimes act as if the law of karma applies to them. Jesus' disciples, the Pharisees, when they would come across a suffering person, what did they do? And Jesus would contradict them each time. He didn't seem to buy into the law of karma. E. Stanley Jones, one of the great Methodist missionaries to India, came up with a phrase that I think has a lot of truth. He said, Hinduism explains everything and changes nothing. Christianity explains nothing and changes everything. <laughs> and everywhere you go where Christian missionaries have been, you find clinics and orphanages and shelters and hospitals, leprosy centers. It's no accident that the first Americans who contracted the Ebola virus in our time were Christian missionaries on the front lines of suffering. Explains nothing, changes everything. We're left with much mystery, a faith that goes against all reason. And that actually is part of what the Bible says in the book of Job, perhaps its oldest story, where the least deserving person suffers the most. It's a mystery that haunts me still. As I look back, there are three things that have helped me in some ways, in varying degrees, come to terms with this mystery, although I must admit never when I'm the one suffering. The first is I remember the view from the Hubble telescope, the view of the universe that I get from the Hubble telescope. I read from an astronomer that if we could see everything in the universe if you held up a dime at arm's length, you would blot out 10 million stars. The universe is that full. And when God, at the end of Job, the longest single speech by God, when God had his say, he expressed it by, well, I'll paraphrase. He said to Job, okay, Job, you don't like the way I'm running the world? Let's compare resumes, you and I. I go first. <laughs> and then in those three chapters, beautiful, poetic, amazing chapters, he explains what it's like to try to run the universe. Again, to quote Frederick Buechner, God doesn't explain. He explodes. He asks Job who he thinks he is anyway. He says that to try to explain the kinds of things that Job wants explained would be like trying to explain Einstein to a little neck clam. <laughs> God does not reveal his grand design. He reveals himself. And the message behind the splendid poetry boils down to this. Job, unless 
you know a little more about running the physical universe. Don't tell me how to run the moral universe. And somehow that explanation or non-explanation proved effective to Job, who responded, I repent in dust and ashes. I spoke of things I could not possibly understand. I can't even run my little corner of the planet, much less a universe so large that a dime blots out 10 million stars. Your job, Job, is to trust against all reason, as Job ultimately did. And that's the same principle that is described in Hebrews 11, which is a list of people who went through very hard times, unexplainable suffering, and yet believed anyway. The key question we're told is posed by suffering is, is God trustworthy? And those triumph who conclude, yes, against all reason, against all reason, though we cannot rationally defend it. That's the first thing I remember about suffering, the view from the Hubble telescope, the view that Job got a tiny glimpse of. The second is a wistful hope in a recreated future. Christianity is a resurrection faith, which is well captured in poem by the Polish poet Czesław Milosz, also a Nobel Prize winner, who, who wrote in this world. It appears that it was all a misunderstanding. What was only a trial run was taken seriously. The rivers will return to their beginnings the wind will cease in its turning about. Trees, instead of budding, will tend to their roots. Old men will chase a ball, a glance in the mirror. They are children again. The dead will wake up, not comprehending, till everything that has happened will unhappen. What a relief. Breathe freely, you who suffered much. The church has misused that hope, I know, promising pie in the sky as a way of avoiding justice issues on this earth, yet we dare not discount it. Remember the slave spirituals probably sung by the slaves who were building some of the buildings we're in the midst of right now. They sang in code, and maybe one of the former CAPS lecturers, Albert Raboteau, explained that. They talked about yearning for Canaan land, Beulah land, crossing the Jordan, when what they were really saying was, I want to go north. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get out of Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> but if I don't make it, if I spend my miserable life in chains on a rice plantation in South Carolina or a tobacco farm in Virginia, I better hope there's something better someday. God owes us something, as the rabbis concluded in Auschwitz. Martin Luther King Jr. said about injustice, how long? Not long, because the arm of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. God can be trusted, he concluded, against all evidence, all reason, and that future reckoning is the only possible answer to the rabbi's lament that God owes us something. Because of the things I've write, I write, I've been called to speak on suffering to places of very deep suffering. Virginia Tech, just after the shootings there. Japan, shortly after the tsunami that killed 20,000 people. Mumbai, India, where we happen to be the night of the Taj Mahal hotel bombings and shootings. By far the hardest was the smallest in terms of scale, and that was Newtown, Connecticut in 2012 after the Sandy Hook shootings. There were many questions swirling around in the hearts and minds of parents and teachers and administrators and first responders and common citizens of Newtown, Connecticut. But there was one 
question that hung in the air more hauntingly, more poignantly than any other, than any question of theodicy or causation, and that was, for those who kissed their six-year-old, seven-year-old children goodbye that morning and put them on a school bus and were called later that afternoon to a morgue to identify their bloody, bullet-ridden body, the question was, will I ever see my son or daughter again? That's all that mattered, not these other questions. That resurrection hope that is so integral to the faith many of us believe. Do not discount the power of a resurrection faith. That hope can keep us from drowning in an ocean of sorrow. There's one more lesson that is perhaps most important the reason there is a Christian religion in the first place, and that is that God grieves and suffers with us. We forget what a recent and radical notion that is. Much of Christian theology was worked up under Greek ways of thinking, modes of thinking. The Greeks believed that a being, a divine being, unlike humans, is apathos, apathetic, without feeling, without passion. And a lot of Christian theology reflects that. The Anglican communion, communion and the Westminster Confession both declare that God is without body, parts, or passion. Can a distant, unchanging, sovereign God, one without passions, really feel our pain? Ironically, it took a Japanese theologian, Katsu Kitamori, to turn the tide. He wrote a book in 1946, shortly after the total devastation of his nation, Japan, one of the few Christians there. He wrote a book called The Theology of the Pain of God. And process theologians took it much further. And finally, Dietrich Bonhoeffer concluded in circumstances much like Kitamori's, much like Elie Wiesel's, only a suffering God can help. As it happens, Job prefigures Jesus, the person who deserves suffering least, who suffers the most. And I've concluded that if we're upset, if we're grieved by some of the things that happen on this planet, God far more so, far more so. Jesus taught us to pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Clearly, right now, that lands in the category of Jesus' unanswered prayers. God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. Theologians have spilled much ink on how the death of a rabbi in the first century can possibly contribute to the world's restoration, and I'll leave the questions of the atonement to the theologians. I remember reading a book, however, by another CAPS lecturer, Jürgen Moltmann's The Crucified God. You may know his story. He was a young mathematician drafted as, as a teenager, 19 years old, into Hitler's army in the closing days of World War II. He was an atheist. His, he and his friends kept looking, kept deciding, who should we surrender to the Americans or the Brits, and they finally surrendered to the Brits and were sent to a prison camp in Scotland, and there, to his astonishment, he wasn't treated with revenge or even justice, but with grace. These Scottish women came each day bringing him fresh baked bread and cookies, and they gave him a Bible. Moltmann had only two books that were issued by the German army, a book of Goethe's poems and Nietzsche, and he found that they just didn't do much for him in that prison camp. But the Bible did, it gave him hope. And this atheist mathematician became one of the great theologians of our time, still living, and you, some of you here, I'm sure, heard him speak in this place. He wrote about hope because he needed hope as much as he needed bread and soup. And that is part of the resurrection faith, to believe that this planet, like Moltmann's POW camp, is just a stage in the process of life. And at the end, it will look like one stage, not the final solution. As happened in Germany, Christians believe it will happen in a universe intended and superintended by God. 
And yet, and yet, Moltmann changed over the years. He stopped focusing on hope and instead settled on that image of the crucified God. Only a suffering God can help. It's one thing to believe that God will set things right. It's another thing to believe that God knows what it is like, what we are like, what we go through. We're in the season of Lent, and I know, like, I, I, I know that many of you, as I have, have been reading the meditations that Karen Marsh has written during that season. I was raised in Protestantism, and we used to scorn the crosses that were worn mostly by Catholics around us, especially those with the little image of a human being on it. Shouldn't resurrection Easter be our emphasis? not the cross, but when you are the one suffering. It may be that the notion God knows what it is like means more even than the hope that nourishes you and helps you believe in the future. The trial of God has taken place, Christians believe, and God accepted the punishment. Dorothy Sayers, the combination theologian and murder mystery writer, which is a very good combination, <laughs> wrote this, for whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game God is playing with creation, God has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He's himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life, the cramping restrictions of hard work, hard work and lack of money, to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When God was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Christians look forward to a hope in recreation. We look backward to the cross. Yet, like two spotlights, both of those shed light on the present, the individual sufferings we go through right now in this life. Taken together, they allow a kind of alchemy of suffering, wherein, wherein our sufferings are not wasted Pain can be recycled or redeemed, as the theologians say. Jesus gives the most stark example in the season we're going through right now. Soon we'll come across a day of deep tragedy and despair that we remember not as Dark Friday, Sad Friday, Tragic Friday, but Good Friday, the alchemy of suffering. Some of you have read my Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor, a remarkable book by a Harvard-trained brain scientist who suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage. I heard her recently on NPR, National Public Radio, say, if I had a choice, I would choose having that stroke over not having it in view of all that I have learned. And again and again in different ways, great souls show that pattern. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Viktor Frankl, Elie Wiesel, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr. Suffering can be redeemed. I close my thoughts in this first theme with some words by Richard Rohr. The crucifixion of the God-man is at the same moment the worst thing in human history and the best thing in human history. Human existence is neither perfectly consistent as rational and control needy people usually demand it be, nor is it incoherent chaos what cynics, agnostics, and unaware people expect it to be. Instead, human life has a cruciform pattern. True life comes only through journeys of death and rebirth wherein we learn who God is for us, letting go 
is the nature of all true spirituality and transformation, summed up in the mythic phrase, Christ is dying, Christ is risen, Christ will ever come again. Two themes, suffering and grace. Because of the University of Virginia loss, I have left less time on that second theme of grace. It's one that is brighter in every way, but it continues to haunt me. For one reason, because like the theme of suffering, it's something that the church often gets wrong. The church of my childhood certainly did. Legalism chased out every opportunity for joy, allowing no intrusions, no grace notes in a rather severe world. The church father Irenaeus once said, the glory of God is a person fully alive. The church of my childhood presented a form of religion that could mostly be fulfilled by a person in a coma. (laughs) Hence, unable to go to movies, dance, smoke, or drink. Exclusivity gave us reason to judge all who thought differently as those outside the pale. Personae non grata, that damning phrase that means literally persons without grace. Personae non grata, we judged those who disagreed with us. Racism in the South in the 1950s, of which my church was a part, ranked human beings not by the content of their character, but by the color of their skin. Traditional theology taught me a fear of God that convinced me that the heart of the universe was a frown, not a smile. The church often gets it wrong. Historically, the church has sometimes packaged grace as a controlled substance, like the class four drugs you have a hard time getting from your pharmacist. (laughs) One that only the professionals have the wisdom and the piety to dispense. We don't know what to do with this undeserved, extravagant, non-rational gift from a loving God. Even Bonhoeffer made the accusation that some believers taught a cheap grace. By the way, I assume everyone in this building has read the magnificent biography of Bonhoeffer by Charles Marsh, (laughs) Strange Glory. And if you haven't, well, there's still time. (laughs) I tremble always to disagree with Bonhoeffer, but Herr Dietrich, grace is neither cheap nor expensive. It's free. It's free. And as such, it represents God's great gamble, a gift capable of being spurned or exploited. The Spirit moves like the wind, said Jesus. It blows wherever it wants to. It it goes by different rules, irrational rules. The worker who clocks in at 4.30 in the afternoon gets exactly the same pay as the one who got up at 7 a.m. and worked all day. The scandalous younger brother gets the banquet, not the upright, obedient, older brother. The shepherd puts 99 responsible sheep at risk (laughs) while he goes into the dark to hunt for the one missing. The wedding goes on without the VIPs their presence replaced instead by colonies of the homeless under expressway bridges. This is grace. The religious community in Jesus' day operated by the contamination principle, as religious communities often do. Touch a Gentile or a person with leprosy or a menstruating woman or a corpse, and you're made unclean. Do it on the Sabbath, and you're positively defiled. Follow Jesus as he, one by one, dismantles each one of those rules. When Jesus touched a sick person, he didn't get soiled. The sick person got well. When Jesus touched a corpse, he did not get unclean. 
the corpse got resurrected. When he touched a woman who'd been bleeding for 18 years, Jesus walked away clean, and so did the woman. I don't know if you know the name René Girard of Stanford University. He was a French sociologist, he still is, still living, French sociologist, philosopher, raised in France. He was a nominal Catholic. He thinks he was baptized as a child. He can't quite remember. <laughs> but it, it, maybe every once in a while on Christmas or Easter he would go to church, but that's it. And as a French sociologist, he, he read every book that has ever been written. And, um, Along the way, he found a remarkable thing happening, especially in the 1960s, when he was starting to write. And that was that if you could establish yourself as a marginalized person, it gave you a kind of moral authority. And at that time, civil rights, human rights, animal rights, women's rights, bicycle rights, you know, these, <laughs> these rights movements just started springing up all over. And here he had been immersing himself in history, and he said, there's, there's nothing like that in the history of the world. Because history is written by the winners, not the losers. And suddenly it's the marginalized, the stepped on, the oppressed, who have a certain moral authority. I attended a conference one time, and there was a woman. She's in the, in the Palestinian legislature, and she said, I'm quadruply marginalized. And we all fell silent. <laughs> she said, I'm a woman. I am Palestinian, I am a Christian in Palestine, and I am a minority in the United States. Immediately she had, she had the authority of the entire weekend. <laughs> and Rene Girard looked at this and said, where did it come from? Where did this come from? And then finally, as he read the literature, he decided it actually goes back to that cruciform image of the cross. He said, Jesus on the cross is the first myth, the word he used, in history in which the loser becomes a victor by losing, not by winning. And he said the cross set loose, I love this image, it set loose a stream of liberation that has flowed through human history since that day. And he says, like the Colorado River cutting the Grand Canyon, that's my image from Colorado, that stream can cut through ground, can cut through rock, can carve channels, can change history, and sometimes it takes a long time. How long to change slavery? 1,800 years. But it did. And suddenly we're living in a time when one liberation movement after another is piling on top of each other, and Girard went on to become a converted Catholic, and he said, sometimes the church sits on the side of the bank and watches the stream flow on, and sometimes it jumps in, but the stream of liberation will go on regardless. It's a stream set loose, he concluded, at the cross. The most astonishing reversal of values in human history, he said. Today, the victim occupies the moral high gro ground everywhere in the Western world. One of the greatest oddities of our present time is that in our polarized world, and maybe even at a university campus, you'll have to help me, Christians are often shunned or scorned by well-meaning activists who actually operate out of the very principles set loose by Jesus at the cross, that stream of liberation. We live in an ecosystem of what I call ungrace. Politics runs like that. You bomb my country, I bomb you back. Nature runs like that. I live in the Rocky Mountains. I've, I've been watching animals for 20 years since we've lived there, and this is what I've noticed. Here's the principle of nature. Big animals eat smaller animals. <laughs> the oceans work like that. The mountains work like that. This is the law of nature. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, not a dog-forgive-dog -dog world. <laughs> Economics works like that. You pay. Bank will loan you money to buy a car, but you stop making your payments, and they come take your car. Repo man will come to see you. Abigail Thomas, 
daughter of Lewis Thomas, the great science writer, wrote a memoir called A Three Dog Life, in which she described living in a world of ungrace. Her husband, with whom she was very happy, chasing a dog, was hit by a car in Manhattan and had traumatic brain injury and changed everything in her life. She said, 20 years ago, I asked a friend if he felt, as I did, a kind of chronic longing, a longing I wanted to identify. Of course, he answered. We were having lunch by the pond at 59th Street, watching the ducks. The sun was out. The grass was thick and green. The ducks paddled around in the not very blue pond. I was between lives. What is it, he asked. Excuse me, what is it, I asked. What is it we are longing for? My friend thought for a moment and said there isn't any it. There's just the longing for it. This sounded exactly right. Well, Christians would respectfully disagree. We believe there is an it that we long for. That it is our thirst for grace in a world, competitive, brutal world of ungrace. My most recent book, which you can buy <laughs> in the lobby, it's called Vanishing Grace, Whatever Happened to the Good News. And we can critique the church, as I do, but my main concern is the world's desperate need for grace. Because instead, the often, often the church establishes its, its own ranking system, its own ecosystem of ungrace. Surveys show when they ask outsiders, people who have no religious commitment about Christians about believers, they use words like hypocritical, judgmental, and the most damning of all, self-righteous, when we should be the only people in the world who know there is no righteousness in ourselves, and yet we're considered self-righteous. Amy Sherman, building on the scheme by Richard Niebuhr, summarizes Christians' common response in North America today as either fortification or domination. Fortification. Some Christians respond to the outside world by pulling up the drawbridge, filling the moat with water and alligators. And, and in our country, you can, actually, you can actually be around nothing but Christians all day long, especially in the South. You can buy Christian yellow pages so you can have a Christian electrician and plumber and send your children to Christian schools and listen to Christian radio and Christian music and Christian television and never get contaminated by the outside world. But that's not Jesus' style. Jesus' style brought health, not danger of contamination. Jesus said, I send you out like sheep among wolves, not I hide you in the barn where you'll be safe with all the other sheep. Fortification or domination. We just get our people in office. We just get our country back. If we could just control Washington, D.C. again. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. And if we work on fortification or if we work on domination, the great loss is a world in desperate need of grace that never experiences it. As I was writing the book, I came across a phrase I'd never noticed in Hebrews 12, 15 that became my motto. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. That's a goal I can get my mind around. Jesus never said, see to it that you convert everyone in the world. He knew that was not going to happen. He never said, see to it that you clean up, in his case, the Roman Empire, our case, the United States of America. That's not going to happen. He spent no time giving instructions on that. But he did say, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. To quote Jürgen Moltmann again, the church is where Christ is. The manifest church comprises those people who follow Jesus and embrace the gospel. But Christ is also in the place where the poor, the hungry, the sick, the prisoners are to be found. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, said Jesus. You did it to me. That's the latent church, the thirsty church, thirsty for grace. Often Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees with a, 
a stark division. They would bring people to him, like the woman caught in adultery, and, and present him what they thought were two categories, good people like us and bad people like her. And Jesus would look at that same scene and see two kinds of people, people in need of grace who denied it, often the most religious, and people in need of grace who admitted it, often the most outcast. Those are the two categories. We are all in need of grace. Some, of, some admit it, some do not. It's a free gift. But to receive a gift, you have to have open hands. Otherwise, the gift falls to the ground, unreceived. And sadly, that often happened in Jesus' day to the very people who were most like you would expect him to be. We're called to establish pioneer settlements of the kingdom of God, to show a different way of being human, a way that operates by different rules, upside-down rules, the rules of grace. I was speaking on prayer in my church in Colorado, and unbeknownst to me, uh, a colonel from the army base in Colorado Springs dro drove an hour and a half to hear me speak. And I, at that time, the, the one command about prayer that troubled me the most was, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And I was wrestling through that, and I asked the congregation, who are my enemies? Well, I brought some pictures, and I flashed some of... Uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld's playing cards of Al-Qaeda terrorists, 12 Al-Qaeda terrorists. And I said, these are our enemies. They're trying to kill us. Even right now, they may be assembling IED bombs. What should we do? Well, what would happen if every church in America adopted one of these guys, learned to pronounce his name, and prayed for him? Didn't Jesus tell us to do that? Well, this colonel who had driven up from Colorado Springs took that quite seriously. He went back and formed a, red, a website, you can go on it uh, and check it out, called atfp.org, adoptaterroristforprayer.org. <laughs> He's still in the army, and he has to use a pseudonym for the website. He doesn't want his superior to find out, but you should read, you can read, the response is, that's the craziest idea. You Christians are so stupid. These people are trying to kill us. Pray for them. We ought to kill them. On and on and on with a lot of profanity in between. Why would Jesus ask us to do something so stupid, something so irrational? Well, Jesus explains that you may be children of your Father in heaven who causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the the unrighteous. The more we love and the more unlikely people we love, the more we resemble God, who after all loves ordinary people like us. The stream of grace flows on. It flowed when Nelson Mandela released after 27 years in prison, stood before his nation, just elected president, and declared, we don't have time for revenge. We don't even have time for justice. We must show the world a new way. He quoted Gandhi, take the principle eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth to its logical conclusion, and eventually the whole world will be blind and toothless. <laughs> and then he turned over the mission to a bishop, Desmond Tutu, the truth and reconciliation commission. Grace flowed for Kelly Rene. Just and Donner, the woman convicted of murder. She was scheduled for execution in Georgia. It was delayed again just one week ago as the judges were trying to decide which lethal combination of drugs will be most humane. She found grace in death row. She began a lengthy correspondence with Jürgen Moltmann, over 30 letters in all, who visited her in prison. She earned a theology degree from Emory University, and Moltmann came in the prison and gave the commencement address. If the state of Georgia has no mercy, he said, she has already received the mercy of heaven. Grace operates by a different set of rules. It flowed a few weeks ago as Congressman John Lewis 
The first marcher to be beaten unconscious after crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge reflected on what sustained those marchers from my home state of Georgia. He said, we were trained in nonviolent love, and he said, don't think that's some kind of mushy thing. I got my training directly from Martin Luther King Jr. who wrote this. To our most bitter opponents, we say, do to us what you will and we shall continue to love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Throw us in jail and we shall still love you. Bomb our homes, threaten our children, and we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be you assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process. And our victory will be a double victory. Grace, like suffering, goes against all reason. It's not the way the world operates. I've told inspiring stories with good outcomes, but the, vis the issues are vastly complicated. Can those 21 Coptic Christians in Libya who knelt in orange jumpsuits trust God, trust that God is trustworthy, when behind them stand black hooded members of ISIS with their raised swords? Can minorities in the United States trust God when we have, they have a long history of oppression handed at them by the hands of those who claim to represent and follow God? Is the God who allows such suffering on earth worthy of trust? Is that thin, fragile gift of grace able to stand against our violent world? Is the power that is within me truly, as Jesus promised, greater than the power that is in the world? Both themes are wrapped in mystery. Both continue to haunt me and always will. I cling to them against all reason and pray that the church does as well, so that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Thank you. time for questions and answer. If you would like to come down with a question, um, we have a mic here and a mic there. You never know what kind of question you're going to get. I know there's a barrier. It's always hard to be the first one. And Once I was, I think I was in Singapore, actually, and we had an open question time like this. And the first question from uh, one of the Singaporeans was along the lines of what I've been talking about. You know, why would God allow the tsunami to happen, that kind of thing. The second question was entirely different. It was, Mr. Yancey, what kind of shampoo do you use? <laughs> well, all right, they did say that last shall be first, so I'll be first. All right. <laughs> but anyway, I do want to thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it seems the Buddhists did say, though, there's a cessation to suffering, which means, of course, we can come uh, really to joy, as you talked about it in grace. Yeah. But I noticed you talked a great deal about God and Jesus. Yes. And you didn't seem to say anything about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Christians sort of uh, advocate that there's three in one, God, the Father, and the Spirit. And the spirit plays a very important role, particularly 
as relates to grace. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder, could you elaborate on that so as I deal with grace, I won't lose my connection with the spirit. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yes, the Trinity in 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> And forgive me, whenever, well, you're absolutely right. I gave one sentence about Buddhism, and of course you just, I distort when I do that. And if I try to talk about the Trinity, forgive me, those of you who are theologians, but when I read the narrative of the Bible particularly, it looks to me almost like a, a three-act play that only makes sense from the end looking backwards. The first act is mostly dominated by what we call God the Father. This is the the powerful image, the scary image of God that, that the Jews uh, were afraid of, that you couldn't, you could never touch, you could never meet such a God. It, whenever he appeared, there were usually smoke and fire and thunder, and very few people could, could stand before such a God. The second person of the Trinity is Jesus. We Christians believe that that massive Hubble telescope kind of God became very small and actually became a human being, as I described. The third member of the Trinity, as you say, is the Spirit. And, and for me, it's, it's Jesus setting loose that stream of liberation, saying, I'm turning it over to you. Jesus did great things. I described some of the miracles that I believe happened, but Jesus wasn't around that long. He affected a small, tiny little corner of the world with a few dozen miracles that we know of and a few thousand people. And yet he said, when I leave, it's for your good that I'm going away and you will do greater things than these. So I'm leaving, but I'm not really leaving, I'm giving you the spirit. And the third act of the play is the act we're in right now where God lives in us, not just confined in a human being named Jesus, but God lives in us and asks us to go out and show the world what that new community looks like. And that includes fighting for justice, it includes loving, it includes the things that I talk about, it includes bringing grace to the world. Because the fact is, the only way most people in the world will, will have any idea of what grace is if they see it demonstrated in flesh by another human being. And that's what we Christians, filled with the Spirit, are called to do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Jordan, you have a question? <clears throat> So my question is, what should a Christian's first response be to a dear atheist friend whose sole objection to faith is, how could a loving God allow suffering? <laughs> I do not believe that an argument is really going to help that person. I, I would agree that is the great mystery of the Christian faith. For an atheist, there are other mysteries, different mysteries. It doesn't have to defend things that happen in the world as the product, you know, as, as something that a loving God somehow allows. But why is there a world at all? Why are there things like goodness and beauty? You know, there are other questions that are profound questions that atheists have a heart. Why is there so much uh, uh, compassion and altruism in the world? Atheists do defend that, but they do so under strain, as Christians defend a loving God, under strain. This is our great conundrum. It's, it's the thing that keeps probably more people from faith than anything else. But I, I wouldn't try to take the atheist on, on this particular issue. I would just say, yeah, I, I agree. And what I, it, it's a problem. And, and as a Christian, I take my main clue into what God is like from Jesus. Now, you know, an atheist isn't going to go down that route with you, but as a Christian, when I wonder what God feels about the sufferings of this world, I simply follow Jesus around. And I don't see Jesus lecturing or arguing or pulling out books on theodicy. I see Jesus responding with compassion and comfort and healing to every person he meets who is going through tragedy. So that's my clue into the heart of God. 
Uh, Dr. Yancey, how um, have you journeyed through the haunting nature of suffering and grace and dealt with it from the transforming effect that you've seen and others demonstrate? Well, the, the transforming effect makes it a little less haunting for me, I must say. Um, for me, it's a matter of, of direction. If you go back to some of the stories in the Gospels, when, when Jesus encountered a person who was suffering, there was a man born blind, for example, in John 9, and the disciples wanted to know, why, why is this man blind? What did he do? He was, he was born blind, right? What did he do to deserve this? Exactly what sins can you commit in utero? I'm not sure, but, you know, that was their question, right? Karma. <laughs> and Jesus would consistently deny that and, and say, well, actually, the works of God can be made manifest in him. And, and that's a principle that I see that applies either in the case of miraculous healing, which is very rare, or in the case of someone who lives with a disability the rest of their life, and that alchemy of suffering can enter in. So uh, what I learned from that scene is it, it's so tempting to kind of look backwards. Why did this happen? What caused it? And frankly, I don't think the Bible gives us an answer. The one time when God had a great opportunity to give an answer in the book of Job, he just he didn't even address the question. And that's telling to me. Instead, when suffering happens, the Bible always looks forward. Can something good be made from it? Can it be redeemed? Can it be recycled? And I fill my books with people who impress me, and I mentioned some of them tonight. Victor Frankl is a good example, not a Christian, but a, a faithful Jew, where even the worst thing that can possibly happen can somehow turn into good. And, and that's the emphasis I see in the Bible. And, Paul, Peter, they were writing to people who were going through some of the same kind of tortures and stuff going on in the Middle East right now. And they didn't say, if you pray hard enough, these things won't happen. They never said that. But they would say, despite the fact that they have happened, some good can come. And they'd spell it out, patience, hope, perseverance. You know, they spell out different, the alchemy of suffering, good can be made out of it. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Yancey. Um, I really loved your distinction between fortification and domination. My question is, as the American landscape changes, where you know, white people are becoming a minority in this country, um, the predominantly white church is becoming a minority, as other religions grow in this country, as other political views grow in this country. It's, America truly becomes much more diverse. What, how do you see Christians and the church gracefully interacting in this new America um, that our parents and grandparents uh, did not experience quite as much? A lot of Christians are alarmed by that. I'm actually looking forward to that, because the, the more we move down that direction, the closer we are to what happened when Jesus and Paul started the church in the Roman Empire. <laughs> Talk about a, a small minority with the odds against it and living in a hostile, broader culture. It was, it was a very hostile culture. And here's this small knot of Christians. And Values that Christians get concerned about here, you know, we play NFL football, bash each other's heads. The Romans would, would pay money to watch each other murder on Sunday afternoon. Uh, we have abortion, a, a moral issue that Christians are concerned about. In those days, they didn't have abortion. They practiced birth control primarily by the abandonment of infants. They would let the child be born, nine months, full term, no question about when human life began, and just abandon it by the side of the road so the wild animals could eat it. And uh, on and on. And, and the, the early Christians responded not by saying, let's see, who should we, we should vote Nero out of office. They didn't have a vote, you know. <laughs> Domination wasn't an option. They responded by saying, you don't have to live this way. There's another way to live. 
So if you read Rodney Stark's books, The Triumph of Christianity, The Rise of Christianity, he's a sociologist at Baylor, he painstakingly points out exactly why Christianity spread in the Roman Empire. Because in those days when plague, plague, bubonic plague was a big problem, would hit a town, the Romans would all run away so they didn't get sick. The Christians would stay behind and nurse not only their own, but their pagan neighbors. And when the Romans would abandon the infants, the Christians wouldn't necessarily go and protest. They would just adopt the babies, bring them in, have platoons of wet nurses to keep them alive, and then adopt them into their families. And after a while, the Romans were watching this, and they said, I like the way they live better than the way I live. <laughs> and I think that's what we are called to do, and especially if the society around us grows increasingly distant, secular, hostile even, it gives us a better opportunity to stand out in contrast. I, I grew up in the 1950s. Everybody went to church. You go to a grocery store, and the, cash, the cashier who doesn't even know you says, what church y'all go to, honey child? <laughs> we haven't even said hello, you know? <laughs> That's not true anymore. And I think it's probably a good thing that it's not true. I think the only people who should be in church are people who really believe and care and want to change the world along the lines that Jesus said, to create a new cre creation, a new community that stands out in great contrast against the surrounding culture. And the more the US drifts from that mythical ideal of Christian America, which is a myth, if you're one of the minorities, if you're one of these, you know, is a myth, the more opportunity we have to stand out in contrast as a new community. So it doesn't, it doesn't worry me. Thank you so much for uh, this talk. It was uh, quite a comprehensive uh, tour of, uh, of suffering. My question is, um, in the Catholic tradition, we have this idea that faith never involves a sacrifice of the intellect. And it would seem to me that hope, faith, and love all rest on this idea that humanity will be resurrected, that we will have eternal life. So is there a good reason to believe that we will live again? <laughs> For me, it's the Pascal's wager. Faith is a gamble. It's a bit of a gamble. And um, the Apostle Paul felt that belief in an afterlife, belief in eternal life w was critical. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, you know, if, if it's not true, if, the resurrection did not, if, if there is no resurrection from the dead, we're of all men most to be pitied. I, actually, I, I'm not sure I agree with that because I, I think actually the life that Jesus set out is the best for us on this earth in this life. But the Apostle Paul felt it was pretty important. So, you know, I yield to him. He's an apostle. Um, I, I don't think we sacrifice our intellect. I do believe that, that we at times have to suspend the, the complete logical argument. I don't, you can't make a proof. I mean, you, every once in a while these books come out about people who went to heaven and came back. You know, one's a child, one's a neurosurgeon. You know, it's... People have visitations from the dead. Frankly, I, I'm not very attracted to those. I, I'm much more concerned with what we ought to be about here in this life. And if there is a, an eternal life, that's a bonus. That's a good thing. But it, it doesn't really affect most of the choices I make. Thank you. Okay. Aren't there any women in this crowd? I was going to ask that, but <laughs> I give it to you. Come on, ladies. But um, Dr. Yancey, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about um, the, the Christian's response to suffering. Um, and you, you briefly mentioned um, about how we have seen um, movements against racism in this country um, and against oppression. And you've also talked about um, the Coptic Christians and their response to ISIS as they're about to be beheaded. And, um, 
you know, in Acts 5, it says that the apostles rejoice after being flogged in the, in the synagogue. And so my question is, as Christians, do we, is there a line of demarcation that you draw um, in how we respond to oppression um, from an evil society or, or, or some system or um, to persecution um, for our faith as a Christian? <laughs> I hesitate to make sweeping judgments that apply in every case. You could, you could, uh, you know, there's that famous phrase from, from uh, Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well, sometimes the blood of the martyrs is the death of the church. It, it, it has happened in countries. Um, Japan is a case where uh, martyrdom almost destroyed, com almost completely destroyed the church, and it really never took off after that. Um, so there are times when evil must be opposed, for sure. But in the case of the Coptic Christians, what choice did they have? And, and uh, I have read some meditations by Middle Eastern Christians who, who say, just, just look at the photos, because evidently the, the Coptics who were martyred were, were peaceful. They were not protesting. I mean, they're, they're chained. They couldn't escape. And, and, and yet they were looking heavenward even as they were killed, whereas the captors are masked and wearing hoods and all that. You know, it's, it's quite a striking contrast. And actually that event has had a remarkable effect on the reputation of Christians in Egypt. They are a minority, maybe 10% of the population, and they've often had a a, a difficult relationship with the Muslim majority, but in this case, the Muslims have really banded together behind the Christians, and that has been used for good, just as um, the, the guy I mentioned, the colonel who formed atfp.org, in, in response to one of the letters, he said, okay, let's think back to a martyr, Stephen, in the book of Acts, and as he was being killed, he prayed for his persecutors, just as Jesus had. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Stephen prayed a very similar prayer, and Thomas Roos raised the question, the, the colonel raised the question, what if he had not done that? Standing in that audience, helping one of the torturers, one of the oppressors, was a young man named Saul, who was on their side, and somehow that scene sank deep into the man who became the Apostle Paul. And that could have been a major part of his own turnaround and his own commitment. Um, if, if you're asking me, sh should we uh, use force to oppose the kind of thing happening with ISIS, Christians disagree, I would say yes. <laughs> yes, we have to. Sometimes force used judiciously is necessary to restrain evil and brutality. Christians do disagree, but my own conclusion is yes. In the case of the Coptic Christians, they didn't really have that choice. They, their only choice was, how do I respond? In fear and terror, which would be our natural response, or with calmness and peace, which they evidently demonstrated. So I resonated also, whoa, <laughs> with uh, your comments on fortification and domination, because those seem really easy as Christians. And uh, so I'm personally challenged, and even as I look around this room, I find we're a pretty homogeneous audience. And a lot of my friends, my social circles, tend to be people that think like me. What does that look like practically to move into the middle, not fortify, you know, not, dam not um, dominate? Practically, what should we do? Did I tell you there's a book on sale in the law? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's why I wrote the book Vanishing Grace, actually, because I'm a journalist and I'm a writer. I sit in my office all day writing words. The only way I can tell anybody what to do is, is to go out and find some people who are doing it and write up their stories and try to demonstrate what it, what it looks like in actual life. And there, there are great stories. My favorite one, I was in, a, in Toronto, Canada, and we were talking about ways that we can dispense grace. That's a phrase I use to, to the people around us. 
And I asked them, are, have any of you found some situations where you are able to dispense grace in an unexpected way? This one shy little woman raised her hand in the back and said, yes, Mr. Yancey, uh, I find, I feel that I am called to minister to telephone solicitors. <laughs> and I said, you mean those irritating people that always call at 6.05 right after I take my first bite of hot food and they don't stop talking for five minutes as they're giving me their spiel and I hang up on them? She said, yeah, those people. All day long, they put up with people like you. <laughs> so she said, whenever one of them calls, I listen to everything they say. I never interrupt. She said, I almost never buy something. And, I, and, and then I say, is that all? And they say, yes. And I say, that must be a very hard job. And they say, yeah, it is. You can't believe the way people treat, <laughs> treat me. And then she said, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. and." Um, I believe in prayer, and I, I feel for you. Is there something I can pray for you about? And then she told story after story about these people. You could hear the salesman in the background, you know, uh, buy insurance now for her. And, and she's praying with them, and they're breaking down and telling about their son in jail and on drugs and, you know, the divorce coming up. And it, that's just one example. But uh, back to the slogan, see to it that no one misses the grace of God that if we all did that, it would dramatically change the reputation of Christians, not as this kind of insular group that does fortify and not as this group that tries to take over and dominate and keep us from doing things we want, but as people who seem to have a little more time, people who care, people who operate not by the values of our self-indulgent, celebrity-oriented, success-achievement-oriented culture, but by a whole different set of values. And the only way the only way to do that is, is to show people, and, and that's what I'm calling the church to concentrate on doing. I'm afraid this has to be our last question. We're almost out of time. Please. Thank you for everything you've shared today. I uh, remember reading some, some of your early books. I lost my son a long time ago, and I remember reading Where's God When It Hurts. Mm. Didn't answer all the questions, but it helped. But as I listen to you speak today, I had to ask, you've spent so much of your life and your mind and your spirit and your heart focusing on these very, very difficult questions. I'd like to say courageously, but I suspect it's with a tremendous amount of fear and trembling. And so my question to you is, how have you shown a spotlight on a topic as painful and horrifying and terrible as this one all these years and not been consumed by it yourself? <laughs> Whoa. Um, I, I, I guess that's why I'm glad there are two themes. Because I, I was obsessed about the first theme of suffering for reasons that I can look back and see why now. And uh, as I look back on my career coming out of a, a very unhealthy church that ground people down and that gave me a lot of distortion that I, would, I was right to run away from. The reason I write about doubt so much is because I became a Christian because of doubt. Doubt saved me. I doubted some of the crazy things my church taught. And so I, I started out in the margins. My first book was Where Is God When It Hurts? Second one was Disappointment with God. And then I, I God gave me a gift. I, I never had a father. God gave me a gift, a remarkable human being, Dr. Paul Brand. I, I've interviewed many people over the years. He was the wisest and brightest person I've ever been around. And I spent 10 years with him writing his story. There was this brilliant orthopedic surgeon who spent his life among the lowest people on the entire planet. I guarantee you there's no one anywhere in the world lower than a Dalit, an untouchable in India who has leprosy. That's as, bot that's as low as it gets. These people who have been kicked out of their house literally with their feet where no one would even touch them, no one would treat them. He was one orthopedic surgeon in the entire world with 12 million people with leprosy. And 
being around him, I became aware of the, the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, the most common statement he made, repeated six times, he says, you, I'm paraphrasing here, but you, you don't gain your life by acquiring more and more. That's the American way. You gain your life by giving it away in service to others, I would add. And as I was with Dr. Brand and so many other Christians over the years, I, I came to believe, hey, Jesus is right. <laughs> this is... This is the best for Dr. Brand. This is the best for me. And, and, and so that was a huge step for me because I, I guess I became convinced that suffering indeed could be redeemed, could be useful, could produce good. With these leprosy patients, I got to know some of them. I saw how their lives were transformed by Reverend Fields, the spirit living in people. Who, who simply did what Jesus asked us to do. And I, I mentioned, uh, we had a gathering last night, I mentioned just in November, a few months ago, going to a cemetery in South Korea. It's a foreign missionary cemetery in the middle of downtown Seoul. They've lovingly preserved it and going from grave to grave of these early missionaries. And each one, it told their story, how this one formed the first orphanage and, and this one uh, died of yellow fever, fighting the, the yellow fever, and this one fought oppression by the Japanese during the war, and, and this one formed the first clinic, and this one formed the first girls' school, and the first women's university, and the first medical college, and the, the seed falls into the ground and dies, and great bushes grow, and I've seen that. And, and I, I guess I became convinced of the truth of the gospel, that even suffering can be redeemed. And then I, I discovered this theme of, of grace, because I, I didn't experience it growing up in the church. I experienced the opposite. And what grieves me, and the reason I keep writing about it, is that the church should be presenting a community of contrast that brightly shines against our competitive society. And instead, we invent our own ways to rank people and look down on people. And, and when, I, when I had that first gulp of true grace, it, it changed things. So the theme of suffering obviously did not go away. It is still there, but it is tempered uh, by my belief that, <laughs> that Good Friday can turn into Easter Sunday. And I, I believe that for, this, for the planet one day, but even if that doesn't happen, the pain of Good Friday can still be used for good, just like Stephen's martyrdom, just like the people I write about, and the, the leprosy patients. And so I, I guess uh, at Dr. Brand's funeral, he, he died, and I said, we had a very unusual exchange. He was this, when we first met, I was 26 years old, had hair out to here. <laughs> told my wife, I mean, I told my mother, my hair doesn't get long, it gets wide, you know, but <laughs> she didn't buy that. And here was this distinguished, silver-haired, British, reserved surgeon, Mutt and Jeff combination. And then he, he became my father in, in a lot of ways. And at his funeral, I said we had, a, we had an unusual exchange, whereas I gave words to his faith. He gave faith to my words. And it, it really does only take one person like that to convince you of, of the truth of what Jesus said, that that liberation set loose, that stream. And sometimes, as I, as I often expose, the church is sitting on the bank watching it or opposing it, trying to dam it up. And sometimes, every once in a while, it jumps in. But the stream, as I see it, goes back to Jesus, goes back to the cross. And my goal is to somehow stay in that stream. As we go out today, I would like to thank again Dr. and Mrs. Caps for giving us this great gift today.
in providing this lecture. Thank you.